Good evening. I don't know who that guy was, but my name is Mike Mock from the UT Part Department of Neuroscience and welcome to UT Brainstorms. Uh, so thanks once again for being a part of UT Brainstorms. This is our fourth season uh, and it's our 33rd event, the eighth in this YouTube uh, live format. And so thank, thank you for being here and thank you for being a, a part of it. I always wanna begin uh, by thanking Laura and Ian and Elena Silva, who are Department of Neuroscience members who organize uh, everything and keep us on the straight and narrow uh, and keep things running, uh, running smoothly. Also, as always, the purpose of UT Brainstorms is for us to share what we know and our passion about neuroscience and to learn from you uh, in, with your questions and, and the things that, that concern you and, and that you're curious about. Uh, and so uh, I want to emphasize as always that the question part of tonight's presentation, the question and answer part uh, is really the key. So let's talk about the format then. Uh, uh, our speaker, uh, Dr. Harold Zakon will speak for about 45 minutes, give his presentation. He'll introduce his panel of three additional UT neuroscience professors. And the four of them then will be prepared to answer your questions. Uh, you can ask questions by typing them into the the YouTube live chat and feel free to do so even as Dr. Zakon is speaking. Um, when the panelists, uh, uh, panelists are assembled, uh, I'll be reading the questions and we'll answer as many questions as we can until our time has expired. Now look, if, <laughs> sound like Joe Biden, uh, if, you, if you don't get your question answered or if you think of another question later or just have a question down the road, uh, email me, mock, M-A-U-K at utexas.edu and we'll get an answer. If I don't know the answer, I'll find one of my colleagues who does know the answer. So with that, then let me introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Harold Zakon, who's been a member of the Department of Neuroscience for a, a, a very long time. He's one of our treasured great professors. He's a fantastic scientist. He's a brilliant teacher. And, he, he, uh, and he's done brainstorms before. We're in for a, a really fantastic evening. So again, the worst part about this format, uh, find some way uh, telepathy wise to join me in welcoming our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Harold Zakon. Hi everybody. Uh, let me see. Can you see my video screen? Uh, hello, can anyone see my screen? Yeah, it looks okay. great, Harold. Okay, thanks Felicity. So tonight I'm gonna talk about the sensing brain and we're gonna have a conversation about animals with sensory systems that we can't even imagine. And even how humans have, can perceive the world in ways that might seem unusual to you. Now, ever since we were kids, probably, we looked at the world around us and said, do you see the world the same way I see the world? I look at this apple, I know what I see. When you look at it, do you see the same thing? And do your pets, your dogs, your cats, your parakeets look at that and see the same thing? So I'm going to show you that uh, animals uh, may sense the world very differently than we humans do, and that even within humans, there's variation in the way we see the world. So the first thing I'd like to say is that we are bombarded with potential stimuli, with stimulus energy all around us, but we just detect a fraction of the stimuli we see. So here, for example, is the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, these are waves, and we can refer to the waves by their frequency, that is how often they occur, low frequency, or very high frequency waves out in, in this end on the right side. And each wave we can refer to by the wave length. A long wave, for example, going from one peak on one wave 
to the next one. And that distance is one wavelength. A high frequency wave has a short wavelength. So we can't perceive most of the electromagnetic spectrum, but right in the middle, there's a small area that we call visible light. And I'm not gonna get into the details of what the measurements mean, but we know that at this end, uh, electromagnetic radiation at this end, we think of as violet, and at this end is red. Now, we refer to the neighboring regions just below the violet as ultraviolet from the Latin ultra, more than or above, and this is infrared for the Latin of below. Now, in truth, there is no difference between the um, properties of the electromagnetic spectrum. Ultraviolet, infrared, visible light, all the same stuff. But because we only perceive a narrow bit through our vision, we categorize ultraviolet and make it seem different or infrared and make it seem different. Now, if we look at the energy of the sun, actually the amount of energy is given by the height of the peak and the wavelength is given uh, on this axis, you can see the sun makes some ultraviolet, some visible light, and a lot of infrared. We see the sun's visible light, but we don't get warmed by it. The infrared, we don't see, but that is what warms us. So if you look at a heat lamp, we're seeing red light from the red end of the spectrum, and the infrared we feel because we have a completely different kind of sensory receptor, cells that detect sensory stimuli, and those are all over our skin, and those detect heat. Now, living animals emit heat, especially warm-blooded animals, and here's a thermal image of a cat. We can't actually see that, but we have technology that allows us to view or to sense the thermal uh, emissions, the heat, the infrared from uh, objects and living organisms and convert it into a form where we can see it. We have very sensitive night scopes for doing that, but even more sensitive snakes have invented, that is evolved two different times in two different groups of snakes. Heat thermoscopes, basically, ways of detecting heat that are 30 times more sensitive than anything we can make. They take the neurons that are very sparsely um, localized in our skins and they concentrate thousands of them in little pits in their face. This is one group of rattlesnakes have done this. An entirely different group of snakes independently evolved pits like this, so they can detect prey at night. If a, if a mouse was a foot or a foot and a half from you in the dark, you wouldn't be able to sense its body heat. These snakes do very well, and that's how they catch their prey at night. Well, that's infrared. What about ultraviolet? Many insects uh, and, and, and even some vertebrates see ultraviolet light, but we don't. Bees, for example, and I have to say, if you have any questions about bees, Dr. Felicity Muth is an expert on bee vision and bee senses and all things about bees. So we're lucky to have her tonight. Um, so bees don't see in the red, but they see in the ultraviolet. And they see flowers in a very different way than we do. So for example, we look at this yellow flower, it's absorbing red and green and blue light. It's not absorbing yellow light and their yellow light is reflected back to us and that's why it looks yellow. If however, we see what the flower looks like under ultraviolet light, the flower has evolved patterns to, to make patterns in the same way that there are patterns that we see when we look at flowers in the visible light. Here's a flower that is absorbing ultraviolet around here in the petals, but right in the middle is 
an area that's absorbing the UV and not reflecting it back. It looks very different to a bee. In fact, if we look at a bunch of flowers here under visible light taken with a regular camera, or we use a special camera that has quartz lenses because quartz will pass UV light, whereas glass will not, we can see comparing these flowers, how different they look. And here, some, some daisies and, or, or uh, lazy Susans, and you can see how different they look the, from us to bees. Bees can see even more things than we can. Bees can see polarized light. So I'm not gonna explain how light gets polarized, but the blue sky that may seem uniform to us varies in the amount of polarization and can look dark or light uh, as you look across the sky. Bees can also see polarized light and can navigate their way out to find flowers and back to the hive using polarized light. Even more spectacularly, there, there are ants that live in the desert in North Africa. They live in a featureless environment. This is an ant's eye view of a landscape. No trees, no nothing, and it's so small, it really wouldn't be able to see much. Yet, when scientists have traced its path, here you can see an ant leaving its nest. It's wandering around, going up, wandering, wandering, whoops wandering, wandering randomly. Finally, it finds food. And it doesn't follow its path back, maybe smelling its odor. It turns around and it makes a direct, efficient, short uh, uh, run back to its nest. It knows exactly where it's going. And the reason is, in part, uh, it can use many cues, but one is it can look up at the sky and it has seen the polarized light pattern where it started and where it ended, and it knows what direction to walk back. Okay, let's switch from vision to hearing. Here we have the sounds heard by humans. We hear from about, and sound is usually referred to in frequency as opposed to wavelength, but here a 20 Hertz sound, that means 20, vibrations a second. If you looked at a speaker, you would see it going back and forth 20 times a second. And here is 20,000 Hertz, our high limit, and that would be a speaker moving very quickly. We don't hear in, again, what we artificially call ultrasound, because it's no different from the sound that we do hear, or artificially what we call infrasound, because it's lower than our sense of hearing. We're defining the stimuli by our sensory systems. So there are animals like elephants that make very low calls. And these calls, because they're low frequencies, which propagate well, they can use to communicate with other elephants miles away, and we can't even hear it. If we think about our pets, well, we do a little better than they do in low frequencies. They do much better than we do in the ultrasound range. They hear frequencies we can't hear. And if you're walking your dog sometime and it lifts its ear and you don't hear anything, it may be listening to some sound in the ultrasonic region. Of course, the champions of high frequency hearing of ultrasound are, are bats and dolphins. And this being Austin, I wanna say something about bats. Uh, of course, these are the bats flying out from Congress Street Bridge. So bats use ultrasonic calls, but why? Couldn't they just call in the same frequencies that we use? Well, there's a very good reason. I need to tell you a little bit about physics first. Uh, and, and I should say this analogy of sound of, of waves in water is exactly the same as sound waves in air. For a wave to make a reflection or an echo, it's wavelength, and remember we talked about that's the distance between the peaks of the waves, must be half the size of, or even smaller than the object that it hits. So here you can see on a stormy day, a wave goes around this piling, doesn't make a reflection. 
on a nice day when there's a, a gentle breeze causing ripples, you can see it hits the piling. The, the wavelength of the waves is smaller than the piling and it causes a reflection, which you see here, the blue arrows pointing to the reflection. Now here in the real world is a picture I took last week. Here's a sailboat mooring and you can see there's no reflection around it. Here's the wave, much longer wavelength than this. I turn my iPhone around and about 10 or 15 feet to the side is this big hunk of rocks. And the same wave at the same time hit the rocks. And because the wavelength is smaller, it made a reflection, a rip, um, an echo. So if we think about bats and apply the same reasoning, bats are trying to catch uh, insects. And here's a moth, it's about an inch. And that's actually on the high side. Uh, the large side of what a bat can get. They can get much smaller insects. So if a bat were to call what's a frequency that's comfortable in our range of hearing, the wavelength is 1.3 inches, which is bigger than the moth. And that's like having a wave go around it. 20 kilohertz, which is the upper limit of our hearing, 20,000 hertz, it's still kind of big for a one inch moth and certainly for smaller insects, it's not small enough. So bats call in the 20, uh, sorry, 30, 40 or 50 or even higher kilohertz regions in the ultrasonic range to get the wavelength to be small enough so that it can bounce off this moth or an insect and it can hear it. And so that in case you've wondered, is why bats call in the ultrasonic range. So what, what I've done so far is tell you about some animals that hear and see differently than we do, or in, in ranges of stimuli that we can't hear or see. But we can get, we can understand what it means to hear or what it means to see but there are animals with sensory systems whose experience of the world we can't even begin to comprehend because we know we, we don't sense what they sense. So one example are weakly electric fish. These are animals that I study in my lab. They produce electric fields from special cells in their bodies and they have sensory cells of a special kind all over their bodies and you can kind of Think of them as swimming around emitting a cloud, a little electric cloud. Now they live, they're nocturnally active, so it's dark, they can't use their vision. And they often live at the bottom of muddy streams or deep rivers like the Amazon. And as they swim around, they sense their world, objects around them by how the electricity interacts with, with these objects. Uh, but not only do they use this to sense their world, because they're emitting electricity, they send signals to each other in electricity. And in fact, each species makes its own signal. And within the species, males and females usually make different signals and individuals may make slightly different signals yet again. So a fish may know the electric signals of other fish around it. Now I'm gonna give you an example uh, uh, in a minute. Uh, here are a number of fish and here you can see the, the uh, electric output, the electric signals. And you can see each one looks different from the other and they can tell the difference. Now, I'm gonna show you a recording made by Carl Hopkins, a colleague at Cornell University. And this is gonna show a male and a female fish courting Eat, or the male courting the female and then laying eggs. The female lays the eggs. And um, you'll see on the bottom scrolling past is a record of the interval between pulses. So if the pulses come close together, uh, the record is down here. If they're taking a little while between pulses, it moves up here, but don't worry about that. The main thing is to listen to the, the, the pulses, what they sound like. Another thing, is one of the fish, the males, 
makes a pulse that's a little kind of dull sounding, thunk, thunk, thunk. The female has a pulse that's a little sharper sounding, tick, tick, tick. And so that will allow you to hear the difference. Oh, and the most important thing I did not say is we are, or Carl was picking up these signals with wire in the water and transducing that signal into sound. So they don't produce sound, they produce electricity, but we can take their electric signals and make it into sound so we can hear it. Okay, here we go. Now she's laying the eggs, she's fertilizing them. Okay, you get the general idea. So that's really weird. How do we even begin to understand what electricity is like? How do we sense it? Even stranger for us is the fact that there are many animals that sense the Earth's magnetic field. Um, I, I won't get into detail about it, but when you hold a compass, the needle moves north or south, or I mean, it moves to the north, but it doesn't go up or down because we've kept the needle moving in two dimensions. But the Earth's magnetic field has another dimension, and that's up and down. And depending on where you are on the Earth, the, the angle that the magnetic field goes into the Earth varies. So um, we are lucky to have on our panel John Pierce, who's an expert, among other things, and I'll tell you more about him in a minute, I mean at the end, on magnetic reception. So let me just point out from one of uh, Dr. Pierce's papers, here are some of the animals that sense magnetic fields. It's been known for some time, pigeons, homing pigeons, which can sense a number of other kinds of stimuli um, and, and home with these stimuli, can sense magnetic fields from uh, magnetite crystals uh, in their bills and it's not completely known how they process that information in, in their brains, but they do. So they can detect the Earth's magnetic fields. Monarch butterflies, which we know so well here, migrating from the Midwest and Texas all the way down to Oaxaca, Mexico, where they overwinter. And then they lay eggs and the caterpillars emerge and become butterflies and they fly north again without ever having uh, been on that pathway. They know exactly where to go, north or south. And they, it turns out, have magnetic receptors in their antennae that help guide them. Now this is a small worm. And that's what uh, actually what Dr. Pierce works on for many reasons. He, well, he can tell you, or, or I'll tell you later. One of the things that's interesting about them is they're about a millimeter. They're very, very small. And when you're that small, gravity doesn't have much of an effect on you. So they would have trouble knowing what's up and what's down. We don't have that trouble if we closed our eyes. Among other things, we feel the pressure of the earth on our feet because gravity is causing us to be weighed down. But a little earth, a little worm doesn't. However, these worms like to eat rotten fruit. And here we have our apple again. And we see this worm is gonna perceive this apple very differently than you or I would. Once it starts burrowing into the fruit where it's going to look for bacteria, which is what it eats, it's going to use the earth's magnetic field to guide it. And Dr. Pierce can tell you more about this. He studied worms from around the world and Worms in every place have evolved to be most sensitive to the angle of the electric uh, of the magnetic field near where they live. So he can tell you more about that. I'm going to skip this for now. Certainly, a very interesting story about bacteria having magnets in their bodies, but for another time. Okay, now let's come back to something more similar. Let's talk about our pets and ask why your pets see the world differently than you do. And in fact, why some humans 
see the world differently than you do. We don't all see things the same. <coughs> so I need to give you some background facts first. Background fact number one, when you go out and you take a walk at dawn or dusk, you, know, you notice that it's colorful during the daytime, but nighttime, everything is only in black and white. And Jan Prakinja, or Prakinji, as we say in English, uh, who lived in the former, in what is now the Czech Republic, came to a startling conclusion. He said, given that, the, the, the retina of our eyes must have one kind of cell, one sensory cell that detects light and in the daytime, and it uses that to see color. But at night, he said, there must be a second type that can only see in black and white. Background fact number two is that years later, people discovered these different cells that he predicted. They're called rods and cones. Uh, these cells are packed with a kind of molecule called opsin. And opsins are the first step in, in the visual pathway. They absorb light. And then a bunch of things happen that you know, results in vision. But the very first step is light being absorbed by the opsins. And you can see rods are big, fat, tall cells because they work at low light levels at night and they have to be big to have lots of this pigment molecule, this opsin to absorb the few um, photons or quanta of light. Whereas cones work in the daytime and it's so bright that they don't have a, a problem, uh, tons of light. So they can be smaller and they don't need as much of these opsins. Now I'm not gonna talk about rods anymore. We're only gonna talk about color vision during the daytime. Each uh, one of these cones, uh, so humans have three different kinds of cones and each one has a slightly different opsin molecule and it, each opsin absorbs light a little bit differently. And this gives us our color sensitivity. So for example, here we see the wavelength of light. And on this axis is the maximal response of the, 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 uh, a cone, the photoreceptor cell, or we can think of it as the absorbance, how well it absorbs light uh, at each wavelength. So in other words, one kind of cone, this one, we call them blue, blue sensitive cones, absorbs light in the blue range, but it falls off and doesn't absorb light at all, you know, not well in the green, not, not at all in the yellow, orange, or red. We're ignoring rods, but we have a second kind of cone where the opsin molecule is slightly different and it absorbs light a little bit in the blue, but very well in the green and the yellow, and then less so in the orange and not in the red. And then we have another kind of cone with a third kind of opsin, and, and we can see it tends to absorb light in the yellowish, orange, and red end of the spectrum. Well, this raises a question. Humans can perceive thousands of different colors. And how do we do that with only three opsins? Well, the answer is, similar, is, is interesting. Background fact number three, the color that we see depends on the ratio of the activity of the three cones. So what that means is someplace starting in the retina and ending up in the brain, neurons are making comparisons and comparing the amount of activity of excitement of each of these cones. So for example, a light here would maximally, uh, well, would, would excite the blue opsin and not so much the green or red. And we would perceive that light as a blue. If we move over and say, well, here's a light that's a little more in the greenish, blue-green maybe, you can see it's still stimulating the blue opsin. It's stimulating the green a little bit and not much the red. 
and we can move over yet into uh, you know more of the warm color range and now we're getting say yellows and that is yellow light and that doesn't stimulate the blue cone very well but it's doing a good job on the green and a pretty good job on the red etc cetera, etc cetera. so each light each wavelength of light is going to give a different ratio of excitation of the three cones now Ultimately, color vision is more complicated than that, but to a first approximation, it's the ratio of light that's important. Now I'm gonna tell you another background fact that's gonna seem like it's out of the blue. Background fact number four, mammals evolved from reptiles during the age of dinosaurs. And for millions of years, millions of years, our ancestors were small, nocturnal, night active, teeny little night active animals. And we know this from fossils and other things. So here, for example, I don't know if you are dinosaur fans. I used to collect plastic dinosaurs when I was a kid. Um, this Dimetrodon is not a dinosaur, but a relative of dinosaurs and a reptile. And eventually over millions of years, mammals evolved from uh, uh, reptiles like that. Okay, now you have all the background facts and we can dig into what um, our pets see. Most vertebrates have four cone opsin types and they're tetrachromats. Tetra from the Greek, I believe, word for four and chromat means color, like kodachrome. Anyway, tetrachromats have four different opsin genes uh, or, or cones with, with uh, each with its own opsin that absorbs in the violet, blue, green, and red part of the spectrum. Now, remember, I told you that, uh, oh, I didn't tell you. I, 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 what I did tell you, sorry, was that our ancestors were nocturnal. Our mammalian ancestors were nocturnal. And we know that during their long night, they lost two genes for opsins. So each of these opsins, like every other protein in your body, is encoded by a gene somewhere in your genome. And if a gene gets a mutation and that's a bad thing, then that animal may just die or not leave. Uh, babies behind. But sometimes actually having a disrupted gene can be a good thing. So, and eventually more and more mutations can occur. And then eventually through mechanisms we can't really talk about that gene is lost from the chromosomes. So it turns out that the gene for an opsin for blue and an opsin for green were lost in our ancestors or mammalian ancestors. So you might say, well, how could that be good? Well, there is an advantage. If when they lost genes for opsins, they had two fewer kinds of cones. The extra space was taken up by more rods and rods, uh, more rods resulted in better night vision. And if you're a nocturnal animal, Better night vision is a big advantage. So they didn't need all those cones during the daytime. This improved their night vision. Now there's one other consequence of the fact that it is the middle two, the blue and the green that got lost, leaving us only something out in the violet range and some, uh, another cone opsin in the red. Now I'm gonna use pet, uh, uh, your dog, if those of you who have a dog, as an example for what mammalian vision in general, most mammals uh, is like. So remember, they have only two cones. It, it turns out that for dogs, the, the cone that's sensitive to violet is actually shifted more to be blue because of some, well, it's just, it's shifted more. And the one that's in the red 
is shifted a little more to be more sensitive to yellow. Um, we're ignoring the rods. Now notice because the two cones in the middle, I'm going back now, in the middle are gone, there's very little overlap in the spectrum of colors. And since the brain uses ratios, there's only a very small region where it can compare. So whereas we see all these colors of the spectrum, your dogs and most mammals see, well, let's say your dogs see mostly violet to bluish without much differentiation, a little region of maybe green here and a lot of yellowish um, and they don't distinguish between orange and red, etc. In fact, if we wanted to see what a dog sees, here's an image. This is mostly with, as you can see, red, orange, yellows, greens, very colorful. But a dog is not colorblind, but you can see it has a very flat sense of color. Uh, you can see a little bit of green here. They, so they're not colorblind, but they don't see color well. So they are what we call dichromats, dye for two. They have two um, options, so they have dichromatic color vision, and that's not very good. So that raises the question, okay, we humans have trichromatic color vision. We have three options. Where did the extra opsin come from? So now I need to tell you a little bit about genetics. Imagine that this uh, rectangle is a chromosome and on that chromosome is a gene for the opsin that's sensitive to blue. On another chromosome happens to be an X chromosome and we'll come back to that later. It's very important in our story, but for now, just think about here's a chromosome and on that other chromosome, there's a gene for the red sensitive opsin. Now uh, in old world primates, and I will describe who they are in a minute, it was known that this red opsin gene duplicated. So in the same way the genes can have mutations and eventually get lost, other times genes can make a, a copy of themselves. And so you have an extra copy. So in this case, in a, an ancestor of ours, an old world primate, there was a duplication of the red opsin gene. And then over time, there were other mutations in the gene that changed its sensitivity to light and it became sensitive to green. So now this is how humans have a blue, red and green opsin gene, how we have trichromatic vision with three colors. Now, uh, you might say, well, it's green, just like one of the ones you said that we lost. So how do you know it isn't the same old gene? And the answer is very easy. If we actually look at the molecular sequence, the DNA of the gene for uh, the one that we and other primates use for opsin, it's very different from the green opsin that birds and reptiles use. And if we look at the molecular sequence of the opsin and compare it to the primate red opsin, there are only a very few changes. So that proves that the gene came from a duplication of the red opsin and is not uh, an old green opsin hanging around. Okay, now here is the lineage of primates. And you can see there uh, what we would call primitive uh, primates like lemurs. Um, and some of these are night active and they've even lost one of their two opsin genes and they don't even see color at all. They put all their eggs in the basket of night vision. Well, if you look at how many opsin genes there are in all these different uh, primates, we see that uh, New World monkeys, those are like howler monkeys, squirrel monkeys, don't have this extra opsin gene, but all old world monkeys, and that would be like baboons, uh, uh, great apes, um, whether they're 
um, or, or other monkeys in Asia. That's what makes them old world. They're either Asian or African, all the way to humans, which of course are African in our origin. We all have trichromatic vision with three opsin genes. So what might have been the advantage of our primates having trichromatic color vision? Well, many primates, actually in the new and the old world, but many primates eat ripe fruit. So it's hypothesized that one reason that the opsin uh, gene uh, was an advantage is as we go back to our friend, the apple, a ripe apple or a ripe piece of fruit is red. An unripe piece of fruit is often green, but a dichromat, uh, like your dog, can't tell the difference. So having three opsins was probably very good for our primate ancestors. Now, we also know that we can have mutations in our red or green opsin genes, and that happens, when that happens, we, we often call it color blindness. So while there are some people who cannot see any color, they're very rare. More commonly are people who only have two functioning opsin genes and they like other mammals are dichromats. So uh, if we go back to the chromosomes, one thing to point out, if uh, the gene for the red opsin is disrupted, is mutant, and a person, and I can say most likely a man, and you'll see why in a minute, has only a blue opsin and a green opsin, it's going to see, he's going to see as a dichromat, but the ratio of the two opsins will be a little different than another man who has a mutation in the green opsin. He will have only these two. And because they absorb, the green and the red absorb different lights, uh, different wavelengths, each one of these people, while we call them both colorblind, will see the world a little bit differently from each other and those of us who have three opsins. Now, here's where we get to the um, sex chromosomes. So males, as you know, are XY. We get the X chromosome from our mothers and the Y chromosome from our fathers. So if the, green, uh, the red opsin gene is mutant, let's say this male gets a, a mutant gene from his mother or has his own mutation that knocks it out, he's gonna be colorblind. But females have something very interesting. This little guy flipping a coin reminds us that because women have two X chromosomes during development, each cell in a woman's body as she develops picks one of those X chromosomes to use and bundles the other one up. So it, it's only using one of the Xs, but that's a random process. So half of her cells in her body will have one X chromosome, the other half will have the other X chromosome. So as far as the cones go, she will have a blue, uh, a cone opsin with blue. She will have cone, a cone opsin with the green and she will have a cone opsin with the red. And even though only half of her red cones are functional, that's enough to give us color vision. So that's why women rarely are colorblind. So I'd like to uh, talk about a slightly different scenario. Sometimes a mutation can not get rid of the gene entirely, but alter the wavelength of light that it can sense. So here is a, a someone with a blue opsin, a green opsin gene, and I'm just saying for the sake of argument, Maybe the green opsin no longer detects green, but it's most sensitive to, oh, burnt orange. And I know there are probably people out there who only have burnt orange receptors in your retinas. At any rate, um, if we ask what happens in the two sexes, 
If it happens in a male, there's still a trichromat. They see, would see differently. They would see color differently because the amount, uh, the, the, the spectrum of light that this opsin in, uh, encoded by this gene would see is different. It's not green, it's orangey. So the nature of the color would look different. Their color sensitivity would be shifted, but they are still trichromats. However, females give us a very interesting possibility. If this woman were the daughter of this man, she might have inherited his, uh, well, she would have inherited his X chromosome with this altered gene. And from her mother, she would get a normal X chromosome. So she has one blue, green, and red opsins, but now she would have a new opsin. She would have four opsins. She could be a tetrachromat. And in fact, vision scientists have searched for such women and it's difficult to find them and you need rigorous testing. Some of you may have seen something like this you could do on a computer, you can't. We can talk about that later. You can't do it on a computer. But it is rare, but some women are bona fide tetrachromats, and they are capable of seeing thousands more color than the rest of us. So I'll just uh, show you one example. Here's a woman uh, rigorously studied, and she has blue, green, and red, but an extra opsin uh, that falls between these, and that gives her four options to compare in a ratio and gives her an enhanced extended view of color vision. Now there's one last uh, woman I, I'd like to share with you. She's the most famous tetrachromat. She's an artist living in San Diego. Her name is Conceta Antico. And uh, she grew up being a painter uh, obsessed with color and light. She didn't know she was a tetrachromat because how can you know? You don't know what other people see. You only know what you see. Uh, eventually she was tested. I'm not sure of the story. We may have a visitor in the audience who's an expert on tetrachromatism. And if she joined us tonight, she may be able to tell us more about it. But um, here are her paintings, which she painted as a tetrachromat, but we can only see as a trichromat. So we don't even know, we can't even begin to understand how she sees the world or how she is painting. So just to sum up, I wanted to um, give you the idea that we perceive a limited range of the, all the stimuli that impinge on our senses and that different species have evolved to detect different kinds of stimuli uh, and many cases stimuli we can't even begin to imagine. And this depends on their evolutionary needs, on their ecology. Uh, due to genetic differences, different individuals may see color differently from each other, depending on if we have a subtle difference in our opsins, if we only have two opsins, or in rare cases, if we have four opsins. So I would li like to just wrap up and give some thanks. Thanks to the National Science Foundation for funding my research. Thanks to the University of Texas for being such an amazing institution and a great place to work. Uh, thanks in advance to our panelists, Felicity Muth, Ian Nauhaus, and John Pierce. And thanks also to Mike, Laura, and Elena for organizing this. Thank you. Oh, and one more thanks. Thanks to all of you for tuning in. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Hi. You're gonna introduce your panelists then now? Fantastic, yes. we're I clapping. I know we're pausing for the applause. <laughs> um, but tell us about your panelists, please. Okay. Um, 
you can see our panelists. So I, uh, I mentioned Dr. Muth first. She's the newest addition to our faculty. She's in integrative biology. If you ever want to know anything about bees, ask her. She studies the foraging behavior of bees, including their color vision and what kinds of uh, other things they sense that guide them in their, their journey to find flowers. And they're amazingly um, advanced intelligence. So she can tell you about that. John Pierce, uh, actually his main research using these teeny little worms is to study um, the effects of alcohol on the nervous system or to study uh, diseases like Alzheimer's, uh, Down syndrome, because the genes that produce neurons are so old, so conserved, that is, that we share them even with some simple worms. But in his studies, he has stumbled onto the fact that these worms can sense magnetic fields. So he's an expert on how animals in general sense magnetism. Ian Nauhaus, also a, well, not quite so new member, uh, studies the visual system. He studies how uh, the, the very complex processes by which vision in the retina is mapped onto the brain and all the different attributes that we see in the world, how things move, how things look with color, etc all fuse into one image of a visual world. And he's an expert in how the brain interprets color. So take it away. Okay, fantastic. So I'll be reading the questions that you guys are typing in. Please continue to type your questions. Uh, I'm jumping around a bit. If it looks like I've skipped your question, likely we'll come back to it. But I wanna start, the, I see two questions that are about animal perception. One is about hummingbirds and what they can sense, and one was about whales and whether their hearing is similar to, to elephants. So let's start with some animal questions. Hummingbird one, if you like, and you can do the whale one. Uh, what did you say? I said I'd be happy to answer the hummingbird one. Okay, and then I'll try the whale one. Yeah, so, so hummingbirds, are they have four cones like uh, Harold was talking about how we have three cones so like other birds they can probably see more color than us and there was actually a study that came out in the last year where they did experiments where they they had um like different lights that lighted up and some of these had uv in them which birds can see but we can't and the interesting thing was is in the same way that you know, we can see blue and we can see yellow and then we can see green. And the colors that we see, you know, are combinations of other colors. It was the same thing with the hummingbirds. So they had um, like UV green or UV red. And that combination of the UV and the green was a completely different color to them. Um, and so what this, this study showed was that, yeah, they can see all these colors that, that we can't see. Great. As far as, uh, as, far as whales, I, I guess um, I, I can answer that. So whales also use high frequency calls for, uh, and porpoises, etc. the dolphins, uh, for detecting prey in the same way that bats do. They use high frequencies and they bounce back. And with the echoes, essentially it's sonar. Uh, they are uh, picking up echoes from the prey and that's how they detect them, but they can also make sounds in very low frequency or audible ranges. And you may know, you may have read that humpback whales have individual songs uh, and um, they can communicate with each other for, in many cases, hundreds of miles. And the reason is uh, sound waves are four times longer in water than they are in air. So that gives you, you know, for the same frequency of sound, it's four times further away. So any distance that let's say we can 
communicate with a particular frequency, that underwater that will go four times faster. So the long and short of it is, they also echolocate like bats and, and some species use low frequency, long distance communication to keep in touch with each other. Great, so let's go right to the challenging questions. We've got two that are more philosophical. Um, one from Andrea wants to know whether snakes see heat or feel it. And Joe wants to know how we can tell that if what, what she perceives as green is what other people perceive as green. Well, how about if I take the snake question and then I, I would suggest maybe Ian uh, could take the other question about human perception. You can uh, give it a shot, yeah. <laughs> okay, so as far as the snakes go, that's a very interesting question. They may feel, I, I, you know, I don't know, not being a snake, whether they feel it or see it. Now, one, one thing that I should tell you is there's a certain part of our brain in, in a, an area called the midbrain that gets different sensory inputs and those form maps. And so for example, our visual map that we make of the world is, is uh, encoded by neurons in this area. The auditory map that we make of the world, and that's another whole question, how we can map out a whole world with only two ears. But at any rate, the auditory map is right below the visual map and the, the body map is right below that in, in our brains or in most animals like a rat's brain. And those maps are in register. So the same point in space is mapped in the three uh, different uh, domains, vision, auditory, and, and body. Um, infrared receptors in snakes is mapped there too. And so there, uh, map of space, what's around them, is the mouse to the right of them or the left of them, is also forms a map. And so I don't know what it feels like, but it's integrated with their other sensory systems. And I'll just say one thing, as, as far as we are talking about integration, you know, we're talking about different senses, and yet we perceive one world, one experience. And the one big question in neuroscience is how do our different sensory systems all blend together to give us an experience of one world? Ian, you're on. Well, thanks, Harold. Um, let me just kind of follow up on, on that real quick. So do, do the snakes have a focusing mechanism to, to map the heat um, spatially? so that it can be mapped spatially in the brain? Um, they don't have a lens like we do, but I'm sure you're, you're familiar with the fact that there are some, you know, if you look at eyes of different animals, some animals have very simple eyes, some animals have complex eyes with lenses and pupils and all of that. Um, there's a kind of eye called the pinhole camera. It's very simple and it can map out space. Well, the, the infrared receptors are kind of like that. Mm -hmm. So they, they have a somewhat crude uh, mapping of space around them. Plus there's right and left sides. So if something's more to the left, it's gonna impact on the left side more than the right. So yes, they can map out their world. Cool. Okay, so um, do, do we all see green? Um, do we all think of green the same way? Um, I, I don't believe anybody knows the answer to that question. Um, That's why I gave it to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll try to say something about it. Um, you know, as, as a vision scientist, we study um, the circuits of green perception, starting with photoreceptors in the retina, like Harold talked about. Um, and in terms of, you know, how two different people perceive green differently, we, we can only say that, you know, um, one person has the same, two different people have the same 
or very similar mechanisms in their eye um, that create um, neurons downstream um, that respond to green. So we have very, you know, two different people will have very similar um, circuitry that creates green sensitive neurons downstream um, in the cortex, for example. Um, you know, um, everybody's cortex is different. So, you know, a, a green flower is going to create a different um, wave of wave of activity downstream in the cortex from the next person. So um, it's quite possible that, you know, uh, what you see as green is going to be different from another person's. But, you know, um, at the front end, which is to say in in the retina, you know, um, you, you have circuits that, um, uh, you know, um, create green selective neurons that discriminate from red specifically. Um, but beyond that, we really don't know. Can I just clarify, Ian, you mean like slightly different, right? Like it's probably not going to be dramatically different people's classification of green, for example. Yeah, well, I guess the way I interpreted the question was, um, are you, like, if I see green, does it also look green to the next person? Like, what I'm thinking of as green, not can I, not do I see slight, uh, am I able to discriminate one type of green from another differently than another person? The latter would, is definitely going to change across people, right? But the former is more the more philosophical one that we don't know. Would that relate to the, that brown uh, gold dress illusion where <laughs> for some people right. interpret it differently depending on the surrounding colors? Ian, what do you think? Um, I don't know if people are familiar with this. They could Google, what, what's the color of the dress? I forgot. Brown and, brown and blue. Brown and blue. So everyone, if you're interested, you could Google brown and blue uh, dress. And yeah, depending on who you are, you will, different people interpret that different way, the color different ways. That's a good one, John. So while John, while you have your microphone on, here's a great question for you. This is a really insightful question. The question is, if the magnetic field of the earth flips in the future, how is that going to affect birds and insects and other animals that use magnetic sense to, to navigate the world? Yep, people who's, uh, who study, the, the good news is I don't know any animal that only uses the Earth's magnetic field as a cue. That, that's the main idea. They use it as a, as a kind of, as a bonus cue. For, for instance, when conditions where birds went, or butterflies when it's the sky is cloudy uh, or said so, so they wouldn't, they might be a bit confused, I would imagine, but they, they, can, they can adjust and they can also learn. Uh, even the tiny worms that we work with can kind of flip the direction. Usually they orient with the direction to a magnetic field. Uh, and they have a preference, but they can also learn on the fly to move with respect to it. So they can figure out that it's flipped. Uh, and usually these flips take on the orders of 200 to many hundred years. So there's plenty of time for uh, certain animals to, for at least tiny animals to evolve uh, and respond. Very good. So I'm not who to. I'm not who's going to grab this question. Maybe I will. But the the question is: Is the experience of time a sense? And if so, are there instances of people who perceive uh, time differently? My wife would say I do. <laughs> That's a whole different That's question. A question. <laughs> I would say that it's it's not a sense, but it's an aspect of cognition. Um, and so different animals time things differently. And every, I would say different, you know, species have got different perceptions of time and what they're able to, 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 um, to perceive and process. And, and a lot of people study timing in other animals. So how animals use time, both kind of second to second or minute to minute, but also how animals think about time in the past. Um, 
And I don't know the human stuff as well, but my guess is that it would vary amongst different groups of people. Because for example, we know that we have all these tools, right? To help us time. We use calendars, we use watches. Um, and I've noticed a lot of people now referring to uh, time before the pandemic versus time after mm -hmm. the pandemic. So we come up with these landmarks in our time series to help us navigate time. And so my guess is that would vary between different cultures and through, you know, different times throughout history. And I'd add to that that even different parts of our brain keep time and process time differently. We have different kinds of quote unquote timers in different parts of our brain. Some parts of our brain uh, keep track of time in tens or hundreds of milliseconds and other keeps other parts keep track of time in days or, or you know, the diurnal cycle. So. There's a great book by an old friend of mine, Dean Buonamano, called Your Brain is a Time Machine. And if you have any questions about time, you'll find it in that, uh, in that book. So, so here's, a, here's one about synesthesia. I've, he uh, I've heard that some people see music as colors. Could you please tell us about that? Uh, I could if no one else wants to answer this. Okay, I don't know much about this, um, but I, I, I know that it is true that there are people who see uh, music for, for uh, I, I mean, uh, perceive music as colors. I mean, one example, there was a Russian composer, Alexander Skriabin, and he composed music for an instrument that he could only imagine, and that was a keyboard that went to like a pipe or pipe organs where each tube lit up a different color. And, and for him, the music had color. Now, what that means neurally, I'm not sure. I do know people investigate that. They have looked for using brain imaging to see if you give a sound to someone who thinks in terms of light when they hear a sound, do you light up the other parts of the brain? I honestly don't know the answer to that, but I can tell you this is an active area of research in humans. And we could, um, if you send an email and you want to learn more, we could look it up and, uh, you know, give you some links to some studies. Yeah, I, I've met some people with these conditions. And also, uh, I have. Uh, large educational outreach program with people with autism, and many of them will experience this too. So I mean that the the simple way to explain this uh, might be that there's wiring differences in people with these conditions. They might see like the number eight, and they'll just feel see see it red, uh, and, and, and it's kind of it's really crazy to hear the combinations. And it's interesting when I, you meet people like this because they can use it to their advantage to improve their memory, make it easier for them to remember certain things because they associate it with colors or sounds even, uh, sometimes feelings. Uh, and I, I think the, the simple idea is that in parts of our brain, there might be a different wiring that, and, and then you get these interesting associations. I have, I, have, uh, I have a different reaction to even numbers and odd numbers and prime numbers. And I'm a little weird that way. I was appalled one time when as a baseball player, I was assigned a, a prime number as my uniform number. It was just, it was just horrible. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, uh, so we've got several, a bunch of really interesting questions about vision. And so how about if we do vision for a little while? So there's a question about how we interpret edges in our vision? I know we have the answer to that one. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's kind of, I, I, I feel like one of my uh, grad, graduate students um, threw me a, a, a softball there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, <laughs> but I'm, of course I'm having a difficult time articulating it because it's too easy, right? Um, so I study the visual cortex, the primary visual cortex specifically, which 
is in the back um, of your head. And um, it's the first part of your visual system to receive input from the eye. Um, and, uh, you know, so you have neurons that are firing in your eye, you have neurons um, that um, are firing in this in your uh, brainstem that receive input from your eye. And, you know, those early parts of the visual pathway um, are not sensitive to edges. They're um, only sensitive to kind of like uniform um, increases or decreases in, um, in light intensity or um, to uniform changes in color, for example. Um, but then once those neurons um, hit, hit the back of your head in, in the primary visual cortex, um, they're combined um, or, you know, they converge effectively to create um, a new computation. Um, and that one of the, uh, this a Nobel Prize was awarded for um, the discovery of this computation. And that's um, the detection of edges within, uh, by neurons within primary visual cortex. Um, and so, you know, they're very, they're exquisitely tuned. Um, at each neuron in your primary visual cortex is exquisitely tuned to um, the orientation of an, of an edge within a local window of, of your visual field. And, you know, that local window is called the receptive field. Um, and, uh, you know, at each neuron is tuned for a different edge in your visual field. And um, so, you know, um, the idea is that, um, you know, you know that, that stage of processing kind of parses the visual field out such that um, what is actually encoding about the, about the world is, um, you know, a kind of a spatial derivative, if that makes sense, uh, uh, you know, about, about the image. And so it's a kind of, it's a, um, it's a, what would, it's like a, um, um, what's the term I'm looking for? It's a, it's an efficient code, you know, it, it reduces the image to its necessary components, which is um, um, the edges of, of the image. And then that information is, is transferred downstream to perceptual areas. You know, how you perceive edges is not known, but the, the location in the brain of where that computation takes place is, is in primary visual cortex. What about color, Ian? There's a question about uh, how does our vision, color vision relate to the different color, uh, computer color models like RGB and, and such. So uh, how, how are computer monitors designed to tickle our visual systems? Yeah, so um, computer monitors were really engineered early on to um, drive the gamut of our, of our perceptual system. You know, so this, you know, we have, um, it's, not a coincidence that um, you have red, green, and blue um, guns. Well, I call them guns because I, I still remember CRTs. Um, but yeah, you, red, green, and blue LEDs of a display, um, you know, because you want to kind of punch, be able to punch each one of those photoreceptors um, across a wide dynamic range in order to kind of see the full spectrum um, of, co of color that, that Harold talked about. I mean, if, if you had just, if, if you kind of hit the midpoints of red, green, and blue, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to kind of swing across that full color spectrum and, um, you know, uh, drive, drive the, the ratios to, you know, ex to the extremes like Harold talked about. Right, so, hey, Felicity, here's, an, here's a question that might be a up your alley. So uh, Terry asks, how do differences in animal per perception affect their reaction or lack of reaction to things like TV or computer images and sound? Mm. So are bees watching, can bees see television? <laughs> so between different species, different perceptual systems will affect their ability to see screens. And so in a lot of um, you know, I work in animal behavior, a lot of behavioral experiments, people will use videos of animals to play to the animal. Um, and a question that people always have is, you know, can, does it, how does the animal see this? Does it see it the way that we see it? And of course, 
as an experimenter, you have to be sure that for your animal, you're showing it stimuli that it can see. Um, I feel like this question is probably more about um, differences, maybe also like within species, right? Because we think about like dogs or cats, where maybe one dog will react to a television and one won't. And in that case, it's probably that they're, that they're seeing the same thing, but they're, how they're processing that information is different, I would guess. Um, and some of it is probably comes down to experience, right? But at first, an animal might react to uh, something they can see on a TV screen, and then over time, they learn that it's not a real stimulus and they stop reacting, whereas I guess other animals maybe don't stop reacting. Um, I don't know, Ian might have more to add on that. You did uh, better than I would have done. <laughs> That's good. I had, a, I had a friend in graduate school who tried to train rabbits in a certain task with a visual stimulus, and he reported back to us that they couldn't learn this. And then we had to sheepishly tell him that he was using a red LED and that rabbits, albino rabbits can't see red. So <laughs> you, you do have to be careful that your, 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 your subjects can, can sense what you're trying to get them to do. So there were a couple of really interesting questions about maybe manipulating cones to see color. So there was one question about if we could add new options to our cones, could we see more colors? And somebody asked about using CRISPR to do the same thing. So could we, could we engineer ourselves to see more colors if we could throw more options into our retina? Yes. <laughs> you, you can yeah. also, uh, options work with another chemical called ret retinol. If you were to give yourself di different versions of retinol, you can also change what color, how you, you know, what colors you could, you could shift the colors that you could see too. I'm not sure how safe that is, <laughs> but uh, it's possible. Yeah, it, it's been done in in, in mice and and uh, marmosets. You know, you can add <clears throat> add cones and then do a perceptual task, and the animal can discriminate additional colors. Um, I mean, to me, the, the most interesting part there is that you add it in and um, the discrimination happens right away. Um, you don't have, to, there's no plasticity that needs to happen or anything else. It just, um, the animal um, can, you know, there's, it suggests like a random wiring mechanism, you know, from the retina to the cortex where, you know, you don't need any kind of specific circuitry that's, you know, kind of pulling from all these different photoreceptors in this um, magical fashion, but, you know, you just kind of pull at random from, from the retina and the brain just automatically does its thing without any, again, specific circuitry in place. There was another question by Paul who said he's heard about glasses that colorblind people can use to quote unquote, see colors. Uh, he wants to know if that's possible and how they work if it is. I suspect it's a little bit like Harold's pictures of us imagining what bees see because they can sense uh, uh, ultraviolet and, and such, but um, it's sort of mapping uh, those other colors onto colors that we can see and sort of pretending like that's what that's what they see so from what i understand they don't let you see new colors that you wouldn't be able to see otherwise but they increase the contrast yeah um, that makes sense yeah i i can't i don't see intuitively a way that you could increase your you could broaden the range of colors you could just kind of you know, alter that, you know, by adding a cone, you, you know, you add an extra dimension of, of color whenever you, um, but, you know, without having that extra sense, you know, sensor in there, there's no way to add that extra dimension. Um, I don't, I don't see how just glasses could do that for you. Great. So here's kind of a, here's kind of an epistemology question about thinking about science that um, so what, what led someone to wonder if fish communicate using electrical signals before investigating? So why would somebody even stick a microphone in the water and think about that? Ah, that's uh, a good question. <laughs> so, um, you probably know about strong electric fish, like electric eels, 
that can shock you. And uh, anatomists have been studying the electric organs of fish like that. So for example, you may have heard of a scientist called Alessandro Volta. And Volta was studying the electric organ of a kind of fish and invented the first battery. And after his name is why we have something called volts. Anyway, scientists then noticed there were some other fish that had cells that looked like the electric organ cells. And this was even in the 1800s, but they, they didn't know what they did. So nobody really knew. Uh, and then in the 1950s, so it took quite a while for people to invent technology to record neur neural activity or electrical activity, um, people noticed that there were fish that would swim around and they wouldn't bump into things even at night. So they began wondering what their sensory system was like. And they also knew that they had these funny cells that were like electric organ cells. And they thought, well, maybe they're making weak electric fields. And that was basically the moment. They recorded electricity coming from the fish. And then, you know, 50 years later, we know a lot more about that. Fantastic. So here's a pretty technical question, and I think I, but I'm just going to read this one. Um, well, uh, is there a, an equivalent head related transfer function for vision as compared to hearing? So I think this is asking about depth perception, maybe, but does anybody want to handle the idea of a head related transfer function for vision? Well, I, I, okay, take it, Ian. Well, I, I, I'm maybe somebody on the panel understands what is meant by a head-related transfer function. Um, I know what it is for for auditory people. Put microphones in the ears, and they can I keep see. track of how the same frequent different frequencies would sound at different locations around your head, given your ear shape. Uh, and they use that to great effect now with your with your head, headphones and you, you can make it sound like something's even moving around you. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know, I don't know about, I know I was, I helped out with a lab that worked on that with sound when I was in grad school, but not, I don't know about vision. Let's pretend like it's a question about depth perception because that's the, it, it's comparing, it sounds like it's comparing the two eyes. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say one, that the closest I can come to an answer to that is as we grow up from babies, our eyes move further apart. And, and, and so the cues that we use from our two eyes for depth perception must be gradually changing or else we would be thinking things are closer or further away. So I, you know, I'm guessing on this, but I, I think that we would have to learn those cues to accommodate movement of the eyes. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just say one quick thing about that, you know, so the, the hearing is you um, detect location with hearing, you know, through, um, you know, inter oral, you know, time different time delay between the two different ears. So it's a, a, a difference in the same signal um, in delayed in time that's hitting one ear versus the other. And so th there is an analogy in, in the eyes, you know, so now you're looking at a difference in the signal that's hitting one eye versus the other. And that, you know, because, um, you know, your eyes are two different cameras, so they have two different perspectives. And that difference, your, your brain is using that difference to um, compute depth, as, as Mike mentioned. Great. So I think we have to call this the next to last question. So I would invite our panelists to read through the questions and pick your favorite for the last one. But the next, the next to last question is probably for Ian. Uh, is there a one to one relationship between the pixels in the retina to the optic fibers? And if not, how do the pixels get assembled properly in the final image? Mm. So explain the so explain the visual system in two minutes. So, <laughs> yeah. So um, they, your, the, uh, your optic nerve, which is, you know, the, your retina sends, transmits signals 
um, through the optic nerve, which is, you know, comes out of this tiny hole in, in the orbital of your, your skull. So, sorry, um, this, the output of your eyeball um, re receives input from the photoreceptors and it, there is not a one-to-one -one relationship between each one of the photoreceptors and each one of those optic nerves. There is a convergence from that photoreceptor mosaic. You know, it's, I don't know, one, I don't know, I want to say on the order of like, you know, 30 cones get added together and then they get sent down, that information gets sent down the, you know, axonal bundle to the rest of your brain. Fantastic. And then things start to be assembled in the edges and edges get assembled in the objects and, and uh, it goes it goes from little teeny photoreceptor dots to everything we see. It's pretty amazing. Okay, panelists, so what's your favorite un, unasked question that we can end on? I, I have one real quick and it's just because it's a yes or no. Someone okay. says the brain um, essentially approximates perception that, that should be, if there's any take home, that, that should be um, it right there. The, the brain approximates the, um, the outside world. Yeah, okay. Since that was a yes or no, one more guys. Anybody have a favorite that they wish I hadn't skipped? I wanted to comment on the mantis shrimp question. Yeah, that was a, that was a good one. Yeah, let's, let's end on that one. So there was this episode of Radio Lab a few years ago that talked about how, um, yeah, you know, humans, we have uh, five photoreceptors, we have our blue, green, red, and our rods, and mantis shrimp have got 12 photoreceptors. But the thing that I was really disappointed about in that radio lab episode, and also, you know, something that you hear again and again is about how they have this amazing vision that we not, must not be able to perceive. You know, they can must see all these colors with those 12 photoreceptors. But the study that found those photoreceptors also tested their vision and found that their vision was actually surprisingly poor. So despite having, and I think that's actually the most exciting part of it, is that despite having these 12 photoreceptors, their vision was actually quite poor. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that their vision is actually, the way that it is put together is probably dramatically different to how our vision is put together. Um, and one of these people might be able to tell you more about that, but that was like the take home that I thought was, it was really cool. And I was kind of disappointed that the radio lab episode didn't, uh, go with. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, that's brilliant. Let's end on that. So, uh, this is always the disappointing part of doing this on YouTube live. I want our Harold and our panelists to imagine everybody giving a great round of applause. You certainly <laughs> deserve it. Um, and I know every, we've had comments in, ab about how much they have enjoyed this. And one person even asked if we would do a whole series on this topic. So uh, obviously it's been, a, it's been a, a good night. So uh, thank you, Harold, for your great talk. Felicity, Ian, and John, thank you. Fantastic. Laura and uh, Elena, thanks for organizing. Uh, so just want to remind you that there's a brainstorms coming up uh, in April. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll elbow our colleague to, to, to commit to a, to a, uh, a title here shortly. Uh, but uh, thank you for being here. Uh, please uh, please uh, consider visiting utbrainstorms.com and the 40, uh, 40 for 40 site and uh, uh, helping support uh, growing brainstorms, uh, holding live events across cities in Texas and such. Uh, and the best thing you can do to show us that you appreciate what we've done is to tell a friend and show up next time. So thank you guys. You did a great job. Thank you to everybody. And we'll see you next time in April.